Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and well, it's time for your usual update. Looks like the mission is a complete success. And it looks like James Webb Telescope is in orbit, everything is functioning as it's supposed to, and it's extremely close to being able to finally observe various galaxies and various stars. It's only maybe one or two steps away from being fully functioning. And so in this video, let's actually do a brief overview of what happened in the last few weeks, what's going on now, and when we're going to start seeing first pictures from this telescope. Now, in the previous update on the telescope, I've actually showed you this website that shows you every single step and every single little achievement that the telescope had to go through in order to fully unfold itself and in order to become fully operational. And as you can see, there are quite a lot of steps here. And despite the initial problems it experienced, everything eventually worked out just fine. So, for example, one of the first problems the scientists experienced that sort of took them by surprise was in regards to the solar array or essentially the solar panels that unfortunately were not producing enough power at first. But once the scientists reset the solar panels, everything returned to normal and the telescope started to receive enough energy. At the same time, the scientists also underestimated how much heat the sunlight from our sun would produce on a telescope. And even as it was traveling to its final destination, some parts started to overheat. Specifically, the motors responsible for deploying a lot of the parts. And so to fix this, the scientists sort of repositioned the telescope just a little bit in terms of its orientation in order to avoid direct sunlight and in order to cool down some of those parts. It worked perfectly. And then, for the next four weeks, it was slowly deploying part after part. And everything went as planned. And this is, as you can see, a really, really complex procedure. There are a lot of miniature parts that could fail at any time, and obviously nothing like this has ever been done before. Nobody has ever created such a huge telescope and placed it into orbit around the solar system. With, I guess, the most nerve-wracking and the most difficult part being the sun shield itself. Right here, everything was ridiculously complex. There were five layers that had to be deployed, they were also had to be stretched in just the right way, and they also had to have just the right tension in order to produce just enough cooling for the telescope to function properly. But everything worked fine. And the sun shield, by the way, produces quite a dramatic cooling effect. As a matter of fact, if you were to compare it to a typical sunscreen, it produces an SPF of about 1 million. So that's definitely quite a sunscreen to have. And also, interestingly, the way that they designed this particular sun shield is to create a pattern known as the ripstop. Essentially, it prevents the entire parasol or the entire sun shield from ripping completely if, for example, something like a micrometeorite decides to pass through one of these layers. Which means that even after a decade and after receiving, let's just say, hundreds of different micrometeorite collisions, the sunscreen is still going to be cooling down telescope as it's supposed to, with practically no noticeable reduction in its ability to cool things down. The other really difficult and somewhat complex procedure was this right here. The deployment of the secondary mirror, which basically represents the most sophisticated tripod we've ever created. With the most difficult challenge being the fact that it had to be placed in an extremely accurate way in an extremely specific position. The full tolerance or the error tolerance here was only about half a millimeter. And considering that this is approximately 7 meters in length, and also considering that generally tripods do not really like to align themselves very well, that's actually quite an incredible achievement. At the same time, during the deployment, the scientists have also tested several infrared instruments in order to make sure that everything works fine. And so far, everything is just absolutely perfect. With the final unfolding of the primary mirror that's about to happen right here being the culmination of everything. And once all of this was complete, that's basically when it officially became the largest telescope ever placed into space. But it's still not fully functioning just yet for one simple reason. Each of these mirrors is sort of its own independent thing. They have to be aligned in just the right way in order to create the perfect focus to turn this into one big mirror instead of 18 small ones. And as you can see from this image, a single mirror here is just a little bit smaller than the primary mirror of the Hubble telescope. And so over the next three months, what the scientists are going to be doing is essentially that. 
they're going to be aligning the mirrors, moving them tiny, tiny bit at a time. And they're going to be actually using a very interesting star in order to focus all of this and in order to test whether the telescope works as intended. The star known as HG84406 is actually somewhat similar to our sun and is roughly around 240 light years away from us. And a star that's essentially perfect for using it in telescopes to align themselves to essentially test various instruments because it's sort of bright and it's sort of isolated from everything else in the vicinity and it also possesses very similar features to our own sun, specifically producing just the right amount of light that's going to be caught by each of these 18 mirrors and then compared to one another in order to align them in just the right way. And the telescope is going to be using its near-infrared instrument in order to help with the alignment and with the necessary calculations. But the thing is, this is a pretty slow process as well. It will take approximately three months to align all of the mirrors. And even after this, there is still a lot of things that need to be done before the telescope becomes fully operational. As a matter of fact, the biggest parts here would be cooling down process. A lot of these instruments will take months to cool down before they can become operational and before the telescope can actually see things. So just as an example, MIRI, or the mid-infrared instrument, is going to take approximately 120 days to cool down to its necessary temperature. And all of the instrument testing and all of the necessary adjustments will most likely take nearly 180 days in total. So essentially by the summertime, that's when we're finally going to start seeing first images. But until then, it's very likely that this is going to be an extremely slow process, mostly because of the complexity of all of the parts and everything that needs to work together in order to achieve the final goal. But the most difficult part is definitely behind us. And more importantly, having initiated its final boost into the final L2 orbit, the scientists realized that they've managed to save a lot of fuel because of the efficiency of the mission, suggesting that the entire James Webb telescope mission might actually last up to 20 years in total, basically doubling the lifetime of this project. In the process, making a lot of NASA scientists extremely happy. This is a mission that's been decades in planning, and it now turned out to be extremely successful. Actually, more successful than anyone anticipated. And because the length of the mission has always depended on the amount of fuel left in the tanks of this telescope, because it has to continuously adjust its orbit, because of the extremely efficient maneuvers that were executed on the way to this particular point, it basically gave NASA an opportunity to work with this telescope much, much longer than initially planned. And a quick side note. For those of you that actually love t-shirts and also would like to help support the channel, there is now a new design, as I mentioned in one of the previous videos, that features the James Webb telescope and sort of looks like this. At least that's the first version from when I'm making this video. It might have changed by now. And so do check it out in the link in the description below. Anyway, but there was another question that a lot of people have been asking that I didn't really get to answer last time. Well, why exactly do we not get to see anything right now? And why is it that the only way we get to track this is through websites like this, where it just shows you basic illustrations and just some text? In other words, why are there no cameras showing us exactly what's happening in real time? Just asking for the selfie generation. Well, as you probably know by now, launching things into space is extremely expensive, and any extra weight is always prohibitively expensive, especially if that weight is not particularly necessary. For example, because of the complexity of the mission, the only way to make this sort of efficient and the only way to make it work would be by adding a lot of wide field cameras pretty much all over the telescope. This by itself would obviously add some extra weight. But all of these cameras would also have to have their own wiring, their own connections, and obviously quite a lot of complexity would have to be added to the already complex telescope without adding much to the actual functionality or use. As a matter of fact, by having visual observations or by having visual images from the telescope, the scientists behind this mission would unfortunately get very little extra information from what they needed to make this work. The telemetry coming from the telescope right now is already more than required. And on top of this, because there are two sides with two very different temperatures, the cold side and the very hot side, with one side being also really dark and one side being really bright, it would require some additional complexity in terms of what sort of cameras you would want to use. For example, on this side right here, there would be way too much glare to produce any useful images. 
Whereas the other side would be way too dark and would probably require additional lighting, which can actually interfere with some of the other instruments. And even though in the initial planning phase some of the engineers did actually play around with the idea of putting cameras and even had actual mock-ups, eventually they realized it was sort of useless. As a matter of fact, the extra wiring required and all of the parts required to make this work would just add a lot of extra features, a lot of risks for vibration, and other risks such as, for example, risks of creating extra heat or producing some other unnecessary effects. So because of this, they chose not to actually add cameras and probably for the best. Obviously, the less parts they have to worry about, the more likely the mission were to succeed. And so, for now, that's sort of all we have. The telescope has been officially deployed, it's in the right orbit, it saved a lot of fuel, and it's currently going to be testing its instruments for the next few months. But I'm sure we're going to hear more about the telescope even before the summertime, as it sort of tests its instruments and possibly produces some of the initial, very preliminary images. And once that comes out, we'll come back and talk about this in some of the future videos. Until then, well, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that now features the telescope as well, and does definitely support the channel. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.